Ooh, Saturday Night Live. I don't know. The Steven Samino says Boom Show is live. Issue 56. Steve, come on. Ball. Mmm. Hey everyone, welcome to Pop XP. And before the show starts, make sure to click that subscribe button and click the bell to get notifications when we go live and we upload awesome new content. And don't forget, if you can, make sure to share our stream on all your social media outlets. We appreciate it, and thanks for helping us grow the Pop XP channel. Hey everybody, we're live. How you doing? Thanks for everybody for joining us. We're here today. Now, before we get on with this, tell us what we need to do. I'll tell you. I'll tell you guys because we are live right now. We are live on YouTube. We are live on Facebook, Pop XP. So everyone, anyone on YouTube right now, look below, click that subscribe button and smash that bell to get notifications when we go live like we're doing right now. And we upload some awesome new episodes, especially if you're following along with Steve at Semino says Boom Show. And for those of you on Facebook, if you can, head on over to YouTube, check us out, give a subscribe to us there. And uh, gentlemen, I'm ready to rock and roll. Let's interview some people tonight, huh? Oh, Steve, I, I surprised you a little when I said Saturday Night Live. But why was I saying that? Let's bring it all back. Back in the day when Saturday Night Live was good, not within like the last 20 years and that crap show. No, they used to have a what? Special guest. And you always were excited, you know, you would watch that. And then, oh, my God. So it kind of has something to do what we're doing today as now just alluded to. Steve, we have a special guest. And this has our, been our second um well, he's he's second to Roy Thomas in appearances, and this is the first time we did we're doing a live event with other than Roy. So, Roy, you're in the back burner, and Steve, what do we got today? Tell why don't why don't you fill us in, fill people in, fill me in, baby Thanos. Come on. Well, as anyone who has listened to my claim sales or other posts, whatever it is, when it comes to comics, if I'm not mentioning Roy. I am mentioning this person's name next, okay? Uh, for me, personal hero, I mean, the material is, it just says itself. As soon as you say this guy's name, certain titles are going to waft up into the air and you're going to say either he was the best or he was second best, okay? Out of the hundreds and hundreds of creators, we have legendary creator, Mr. Steve Engelhart, live right now oh. welcome, welcome 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 back steve. thank you welcome and just and just so you know mr Engelhart, steve isn't usually this red it's it's not high blood pressure either it's when he gets excited it's that we will see he gets excited and so he he's a fan and we're so happy for you to be here steve for this live event and now it's an honor for you to be here. Your third appearance, and we're going to keep attacking you for more. You know that, Steve, right? <laughs> Does the redness explain your shirt, too? <laughs> <laughs> you remember this one, right? Swinging with Scooter? Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we got But But, uh, Mr. Engelhart. Yeah. The, the, the First off, the reason why we'd love to have you, but my first question to you as we start this off is, Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Your character, Star-Lord, is one of the biggest characters in the world. Top 10, for sure. And they're going to start now branching him off to his uh, his own movie. Now he's going to be maybe doing solo stuff. Uh, what do you, first off, what did you review on Guardians of the Galaxy 3 and your whole perception of how Star-Lord is now in the ether? He's one of the biggest characters in the world. Well, I mean, I've said before, I was astounded when Star-Lord 
even entered the ether, let alone <laughs> did what he did. I liked the movie quite a bit. Um, you know, I thought I have great faith in James Gunn. I, I, well, let me let me say, I really like what James Gunn does. I saw the Suicide Squad as well, and it was clever and it was really good. The only thing I would wonder about with Gunn is um, he has done misfit groups, and I'm interested to see what he can do with Superman because nobody ever figures out Superman. Um, but, you know, with him in charge of DC, I think for the first time Marvel's going to have some competition. Uh, but he's got tougher characters to work with. That's all I can say. But as far as the movie goes, I thought it was great. Um, I had seen Ant-Man on Disney Plus not too long before. And if I may digress there, I'd heard Ant-Man wasn't all that good. And I started watching it and I'm going, well, this is all right. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm good with this. But then I sort of noticed how every time the wasp did something, she did, and they would, she would stop. I mean, she would just do things. She would take poses. And then when I saw Guardians, I realized the difference is the guy who directed Ant Man would let her do that. He would do, she would do this, and then they would cut. Whereas Gun cuts. You know, when the, when the movement starts, he cuts so that you never look stupid standing there like you're, you know, trying to do some superhero pose. And it's just a question. It's subtle. But, I, you know, I looked at that and I said, I can, yeah, I can see Ant-Man. It just kind of clunks along, whereas Guardians really moved along. So that, that's a, an extensive uh, review of Guardians 3. But uh, you you had to love, I mean... Just the whole, I mean, James Gunn gets it, and I'm kind of sad that now he is with DC because I think he's, that's somebody like they needed. But what is your overall um, opinion on the portrayal of Star-Lord Star, Star -Lord and Chris Pratt doing, uh, doing that? I think he's fantastic, you know, like oh, he, <laughs> the yeah, whole car is. thing, the car thing when he hasn't driven, and he, he, he's like, I haven't driven since I was eight years old. I thought that was hilarious. Yeah. What do you think of all that? I, you know, I liked him and I liked that character. Um, I was glad to see that the legendary Star-Lord will return, as they say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> but again, my Star-Lord was just sort of, I set him up and then never was able to follow through with him. Other people followed through and went different directions. And so, you know, I have no way, you know, it's not like, Chris Pratt is good or bad being my Star Lord because my Star Lord got got overwritten a long time ago, you know. But he's mm -hmm. good at being the Star Lord, um, and um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm I think it makes sense to have him around. And again, some way or another, they got to put together an Avengers group. But I'm not really, you know, I don't know who's going to be in the Avengers group, but um, he'd make a good candidate for sure. Yeah. I was just thinking, what would you think of, like, when he does his solo movie, what would you think of if he has that old classic costume? I bet you that's coming down the wire at some, I would freaking flip out. What would you think? Uh, I've been with an, having an email discussion recently with a guy who wants to know why, in my story, the helmet looked like an owl. And I had given my Star-Lord an actual owl as a pet. But I was unable to remember if I ever knew why the helmet looked like an owl. But we've been going through this thing. So, I mean, there's if they ever if they go back to the original costume, maybe they can explain to me why the helmet looked like an owl. <laughs> hey, Steve, you don't mind me asking for the viewers out there that are, that are watching this live and stuff, and they're not sure. How, how did you even conceive the idea of Star-Lord? Oh, this is, yeah, I was going to do a thing where the guy... Uh, went to the sun and then went out through the solar system. And on each planet, he would have an adventure relating to the mythology of that planet. Um, so a love story on Venus and a, and, a Mar and a war story on Mars and so forth. I wanted this guy to go through all the archetypes of being a human being. Um, and, and I also, my ultimate dream 
was if I did a love story issue, that we'd get a love story artist, you know, to do it. And if I did a war story issue, I'd get a war story artist to do it. Nothing against Steve Gann, who did the, you know, who did the original. But my idea was to kind of like make, make each one of these things different. Obviously, none of that ever came to fruition. So, you know, but that's why he went to the sun in the first in the first story. Mm -hmm. oh, go ahead, Steve. What, oh, sorry. Yeah, because now originally, of course, you know, unless my mind is completely, you know, warped with syrup, the original Star Lord story he wasn't even part of the Marvel Universe. It was a single un unto itself story, correct? Right. Yeah, he was never going to be part of the Marvel Universe in that sense because he was going to be traveling outward through planets. He wasn't. He was going to stop on Earth <laughs> as he made his way out, um, and might well have had some sort of interaction with earth heroes or something i mean if i had done it that's that's possible but basically he would have whatever he did he would have then gone on to mars and then you know on beyond um and this was back when pluto was the outermost planet and now pluto's not a planet and there's other <laughs> yeah. planets out there and you know uh if i were doing it today it might be a hundred issues getting all the way to the edge of the solar system now um but uh yeah that's yeah because it's yeah. you know obviously when it comes to the star lord character and what he's done for the marvel universe it's i mean he chris pratt of course the way he's portraying the character has opened up that character to a much wider audience oh absolutely if he had been the stoic being that I would have written, it would have been four people that would have gone, wow, that's, I love this guy. Because <laughs> my character would be completely devoid of humor and would have just been like, you know, aloof. And then suddenly we get, we're faced with this character that's just like, oh, uh, what, you know, what is this? Why is he in that cave? Why is he dancing around? He's got, you know, the earphones in, you know, and at first, when I first saw it, I was like, oh, I don't know. But then I, uh, I heard the audience behind me just going laughing. And, and I was like, oh, OK, um, I'm in the minority again. And it took me a little while to click into it. You know, and of course, I almost lost my mind in the first film when he was having the dance off with Ronan the Accuser. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, uh, although, again, I have come to uh, really enjoy and love it. But yeah, then again, it's that. James Gunn technique of allowing people to come in to the character mm -hmm. and experience it. So everyone on the street, you know, if they did happen to pick up or walk into a, a shop and read that original trade paperback where it was and read that original story, they'd be like, wow, he's serious. He's so serious in this first issue. <laughs> well, not only, not just serious, but unlikable. I mean, I tried to make him as unlikable as I could. Um, because that was what he was going to grow out of, right? I mean, that he was going to start out as this guy you really didn't like, but then you'd get to like him more each time. And by the time he'd gone through the entire system, he would have become a fully fledged human being. But uh, so, yeah, it's, it's all very, uh, the thing I did launched him, but I was going in a totally different direction, starting from a totally different place. And that said, I mean, I went to the first movie not knowing what, was going to happen they don't you know they don't involve us and and uh i love as soon as he started dancing i loved it i'm like <laughs> yeah i i I'm, i have no expectations but i like this you know so what what's funny is uh chris pratt has the likability like a like rudd like what yeah. like you know the ant-man guy like he just so, so, i didn't like when they were just making thor too funny like I, that that me neither but, no oh, that that just doesn't work for me but but for you know chris pratt it, it's like his personality so it comes out of him and you 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 want him to be there and he can do the serious part so well too because obviously with the rocket raccoon stuff he was very hurting and all that stuff and he's such a good addict but he's such a likable guy like chris pratt and he yeah. brings that to star lord so you can't help fall for star lord i like the character the mcu star lord like i, I do like him because he portrays him right like i said Four? Uh-uh. No, 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 no. Well, the so, first, no, you know, I, I can't. first guy I ever wrote as a superhero was the Beast, and I made him sort of loose and funny as well. So it, it's sort of like 
you know, I had I had written the movie Star Lord character by way of the Beast in a sense, yeah. <laughs> but my Star Lord character is a totally. I mean, I tried to. I always tried to make every one of my characters different from every other character. But I mean, so somewhere in my in my what I wrote, you know, you can find characters who are like Chris Pratt as Star Lord. But again, my Star Lord was it was something just to jump off of. Mm -hmm. Niall, go ahead. You were going to say something before. Oh, no. He, uh, Steve went into it. So, Okay. And, and uh, Steve, I always wanted to ask you, too. Um, what, do you even understand why you always get the two credits? You always get the credit for Mantis and you get the credit. I don't know if you look at the end. You're always written twice. You know, everybody else gets to do you do you have any did you have any idea that they were going to do that? And that's that's so common. It's always you twice. Well, I mean, in the Star Lord movie or in the Guardians movies, um, they get they credit it to Steve Englehart and the artist. And so Steve Gann, Steve Englehart and Steve Gann for Star Lord, but it's Steve Englehart and Don Heck for Mantis, right? I mean, so they have to put that on two lines because the artists are different. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I know. I, I know. Confused. Sorry, no, no, go ahead. No, no, but I, I know that why they would do that. But usually, like if you look at Starlin, they'll put a few, or or they'll if sometimes there's too many. They just go th gets thrown in there with with uh with all the other names. It's just always funny how your name is in there with like they give you the two listings. I, it's just uncommon, and it's just I mean that must be fantastic well, to see that. Well, I mean I I generally pay attention to my name. I don't really <laughs> yeah. look to see how everybody else gets theirs. I mean, but I, I'm i satisfied with the, you know, I mean, I did work with two different artists and they ought to get the credit, you know, so. No, no, absolutely. But it's just funny. I get, it just doesn't, it's it's just, it's just no, they don't do that. Even Stan, I think maybe they did it with Stan twice, but even I'm with like, you know, I'm watching it sometimes with Roy and I'm like, look at, he always gets those two credits. It's just like, it's awesome. And <laughs> hey, why, why, why not one? That's a, you have well, your name there once. Might as well have it twice. Has Roy created two different characters in the same movie? Yeah, but sometimes they usually have his name with like everybody else. Like they had him with the vision and with 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 what if they said like he developed the concept, they gave him a solo thing. But I've never really seen anybody else. Even Jack Kirby's just thrown in there too with all the other names. I've I've been, you know, I, I'm always looking at those credits. You, but you, you, nobody has a, ever had that. So that's a little special something. I don't know if you know anybody over there that's giving you that. No, I mean, I mean, I know people <laughs> over there, but I mean, I had never thought of it that way before. It just seemed logical to me. I mean, when I do in the Shang-Chi movies, it just get, you know, it just has the one credit because there's only the one character. Um, uh, they don't consider the father to be the guy that Starlin and I did. So, you know, we don't get credit for that, but uh, it, I, it just seemed logical to me. I, I never yeah. thought about it. Well, it, it's uncommon and it's great for you. Go ahead, Steve. I want to... Well, talking of paying attention, um, I'm sort of curious because um, I, I was able to chew through my entire enamel whenever <laughs> Mantis came on the screen out of all of the stuff on Guardians, I detest the way that they actually ended up portraying Mantis. I don't think it did anything uh, really good to the character. And I think a lot of the stuff that you did, which I think was very progressive at the time, uh, mm -hmm. would have would have had a, a little bit more meat to it. And the fact that they jettisoned all that to make this cute little bug thing with... <laughs> I, 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 I'm just curious, maybe you're not as angry as I am, but you are, you are in full rights, I would think, to be frothing at the mouth. No, I'm not angry. I, I, was, I, I absolutely agree with what you're saying in that I spent a lot of time creating this particular character with a particular speech pattern, a particular color, a partic all that good stuff. Um, so I was somewhat taken aback by the way she is in the movie, but I like the character in the movie. I don't, you know, I thought, you know, Palm did a nice job with, with what she was asked to do there. I did, mm -hmm. I, I 
may not have said this last time, who can remember, but um, I went to the after party after Guardians 2, and I, and I asked James Gunn, why did you do that? I mean, the last thing that James Gunn or any of those guys wants is me going, eh, I don't know, it wasn't what I was supposed to do. Um, so, I, you know, I just said, why did you do that? He said, well, I needed that kind of character. Um, and if he had called her, uh, you know, Jane Doe, I wouldn't be getting any royalties out of it. So, <laughs> so there's that. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, there's that aspect of it. Um, I wish she had been the character that I created. And, you know, but I'm, I'm totally clear on the fact that as far as the world is concerned, that's Mantis, not the one that I did. Because this mm -hmm. one is on the screen everywhere, right? Yes. Um, what am I supposed to do about that? I mean, it's just so I, I just, you know, I, I, I live with it. I did, I was at a show in Vancouver and so was Pom Clementiev. And we, you know, we talked about it. I, I, the, I went over to say hello to her. And the first thing she said to me was, I understand you don't like my mantis. <laughs> 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 I, said, no, I like your mantis. Your mantis is perfectly fine. It's just not, you know, it's not my mantis. And, you know, so we, it wasn't even it's something that had to be settled. It was, you know, we were just getting to know each other. But um, no, I, you know, I'm not angry about it. Um, you can, you can I, see how she's I would got... love to see it when she takes her monsters and and goes somewhere. I would, I would love to see a, a Disney Plus show or something about her, particularly because I like that character. Too. Yeah, you, you, you can see how she progressively got more popular too. I mean, like yeah. you could argue that she was maybe the third most beloved character on that movie. You yeah. know, you had Rocket. Star Lord and her. I mean, like she had, so, and you can see how a lot of kids, like she was like a big kid, you know, and like she, uh, and she, and and you could see how like that audience would type to talk type type of audience would like her because I I did talk to a couple kids and they were all saying who they loved. They loved Rocket and they loved Mantis. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that's again, I you know I James Gunn needed a character like that. He happened to call her Mantis, etc. But his instincts were right, you know, to get a character like that, you know. Um, so, yeah, just not Thor. Go ahead, Steve. Just not Thor. Yeah, as I said, I mean, that was, of course, one of the big uh, things that I had. But I wanted to bring up a subject that we haven't brought up before because we've had you. Your career goes on forever with the amount of stuff that you've done. But we haven't talked about your era when you went on to do, do the Green Lantern over at DC. Right. That long run that you did, um, you know, and I'm just sort of wondering, obviously, you, you know, you're going to be fully aware of the Silver Age stuff like that. When you went on that title, what were your thoughts? What were you thinking, you know, where were you thinking after, you know, you've been doing all that stuff at Marvel and suddenly, okay, you're going to be doing Green Lantern. What was your idea what, like did you have to pitch anything to an editor or anything how what happened no um um well in the 80s i was working for both companies and most of my work was for marvel and i was doing west coast avengers vision witch silver surfer but dick giordano was an old friend of mine he'd asked me if i could do anything for dc and so i said yeah you know and and i I don't, I didn't ask for Green Lantern. He, not he, but, or maybe he, but I mean, um, Andy Helfer was the particular editor. I, I, anyway, I was given Green Lantern. I really liked Green Lantern from, as a kid, uh, the old, you know, Gil Kane, um, John Broom stuff. They built this really cool universe with the, you know, the Guardians, those other Guardians and the, and the 3600 green lanterns and everybody's everybody you know they're all over the universe they had a whole mythology which was fun to come in and play with and and when i got there len ween was just finishing his run and he had he had started this thing with the predator i think it was called the predator wasn't it i don't know um this bad guy well we didn't know who the bad guy was anyway i mean i sort of came in in the middle of that sort of thing and 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 wrapped that up um hopefully entertainingly. Um, but when I came in, Hal Jordan was not 
Green Lantern and was vowing never to be Green Lantern again, and John Stewart was. And I talk to me long enough and you're going to hear me say, oh, I really liked that character, whatever character we're talking about. Um, because they were part of comics. I liked comics. If I didn't like those characters, I wouldn't be in comics. Uh, and I like John Stewart. And I and and people said, well, of course, when Hal Jordan comes back, because of course he will come back, then John Stewart can retire from being Green Lantern. And I thought, why? You know, why not? <laughs> why can't there be two of them? You know, why does John Stewart have to get relegated, right? And that led me to think, why can't there be three of them? Because there had been this guy, Guy Gardner, who had been a Green Lantern for like an issue and a half before he became a mental vegetable. Um, <laughs> and, and that got me thinking, well, why not have a team? You know, why can't you have a lot of Green Lanterns? So each, each iteration of this thought led me to where I eventually ended up with the Green Lantern Corps. Um, but, and... And right after I had wrapped up that whole thing with, with the Predator and Carol Ferris, um, they began the countdown Crisis on Infinite Earths, you know, Marv's crisis thing. And so we were all told, well, you know, it's, everything's going to happen in, in five months and it's got to connect. I think mean, the only thing they asked for was the sky turning red or something like that. But it was one of those deals where, you know, there was uni a company-wide event. Um, so I just figured I'd, I'd get involved as best I could with the, with the crisis thing. And, and so Hal Jordan's return, um, getting his ring back, Guy Gardner coming into the picture, all these things all kind of fit into leading up to the, to the end of the crisis, which was the same as my issue 198. So of course I had to do something else for issue 200, two months later, and that, you know, and that, so each thing kind of led, but I was working again in, with this great mythology, and so, you know, I love to get into stuff like that, and, 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 you know, the same as working with the Marvel mythology 10 years before, I love to get in and just play with the with the concepts and seeing what I can do with them that hasn't been done yet and where I can go that we haven't gone yet and things like that. But but being as true as I, I mean, hopefully true to the original characters. Um, what cool. Joe Staten and I did was, you know, 15 years, 20 years after what, John Broom and Gil Kane did, and comics have become more sophisticated and so on and so forth. But but I thought they they set up a lot of cool stuff, and I just wanted to you know to go with that. So it was kind of fun to be riding Silver Surfer on one side of town and Green Lantern on the other <laughs> side of town at the same time. I know that's actually amazing, considering I mean just the Silver Surfer story alone was. It seemed like the most complex thing in the world, like 6,000 different subplots and characters. Yes. And then, so yes. I could imagine, in my mind, I'm thinking, you, one day you had a surfer day, you finished that, and then you went, it's Green Lantern Day today. You know, I mean, how in the hell can you keep that stuff separate? Well, I mean, you've said, you've had Roy out a million times. I mean, it's like, I wrote a book a week. I'm not sure what Roy's schedule was, but I mean, mm -hmm. I could, you know, my schedule such as it was was like i would start the week with two days of figuring out what the story was i would then spend three days writing about eight pages a day to get my whatever we were page count was at that time somewhere around 20 to 24. um one day to like let it sit there and think that i cross all the i's and dot all the t's uh, and then one day off and then i would go to the next one and i mean that was that was a workable uh, thing for me, you know, and, and, you know, I would carry around Green Lantern in the back of my brain for a month and then for three weeks or whatever that was. And then, then I would do that. And then I would go and I would write the surfer and where do I leave him and what do I do want to do with him? Um, that's incredible. I mean, that's just the life of, of, <laughs> it was my life of writing comics. I mean, 
if, as people if, always say, what, I wrote a lot more than a lot of other people, but I mean, that's how I did it, you know? If you think about it, you almost had like almost the equivalence of each other in, of space. You had the Silver Surfer and, and Green Lantern. Both were kind of space. But they I mean, were that's, different. But they if were you different. think about that, that is unprecedented. I, you know, yeah. my Surfer and, and my Green, I mean, in general, but I'm just saying my Surfer, my Green Lantern, and, and when I did the Green Lantern Corps, somebody said to me, how can you do a group where they all have the same power? And I said, it's not about the power. It's about the group. You know, mm -hmm. it's these yeah. guys. Um, that's why I appreciate James Gunn, because he's got the same thing about being able to, like, make all these different people um, interesting in, in themselves and then as part of a group. Same thing as writing the Avengers or, or the Justice League or any of those things. Um, so... I was, you know, me and Joe Staten had a great time on Green Lantern. You know, um, I give Joe a lot of credit. Uh, one of those guys where you could just say, let's do this. And he'd like, okay, I'll draw that. You know, it was never mm -hmm. any drama, never like, oh, it takes too long or I can't do this or, you know, oh. let's do an issue. You know, we did an issue where Chip, the little chipmunk guy, the whole story was about him. Um, and... You know, but we also had Hal Jordan and Aresia falling in love in a cave and then, you know, Guy Gardner getting everybody drunk. And I mean, there were all these <laughs> different things Joe, you know, Joe could draw any of that. I never had to, you know, never had to worry about that. So that was fun. Yeah. I, it, it's it, just thinking about that. It's incredible. Like, uh, like I said, that's unprecedented. I don't, I, I don't know anybody. If you think about that, like because even when they have like the Marvel versus DC, it's always like the Green Lantern versus the Silver Surfer. Like that's kind of like a, like a, a matchup there. And I was just thinking, and you're writing both of them for e each one. That's that's incredible. Yeah. I mean, was hey, who better who better than you though, Steve, to, to be doing that because you had such a a great grasp of character. And 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 just to say, really, really fast, everybody out there listening. Think of what Steve, Mr. Engelhart just said. He wanted to be true to the character. I mean, that is, if you think about it today, that is not how other writers approach comics today. You read these stories and you wanted to make the characters who they were and just put your spin on them and play with those toys. Right there, I could even start crying, Steve, because like, I mean, it's incredible. I know as basic as that sounds, that is so alien today. If you think about it, because when you read these comics today, you're like, that's not him. That's not what he would say. And back then you could pick up an issue you wrote or one in the sixties or like one and you pick it up and like, yeah, that's Al Jordan. Yeah. That's John Stewart. That is so as as like I said, as basic as that sounds, that is so radical today. And that's why people should just pick up your stuff and just read that stuff. And right there is just a whole wealth of knowledge on how mm -hmm. to write. Because, Steve, once again, I will say th there's not many that could write that type of soap opera da da drama that you did. Oh, unprecedented. I'm just I'm just just throwing up all this this praise to you because it, it, it I love you, man. I love you. Go ahead, Niall. Give him something. Well, I'm really, you know, talking about the whole, you know, working, you know, you're writing Silver Surfer, you know, you're doing Green Lantern you're simultaneously, you know, was there conflict, though, working for Marvel and DC at the same time? Were there any management conflicts of you doing that? No, not really. Um, I mean, as I say, Giordano over at DC was my was my friend. Um, Shooter over at Marvel, you know, he was a little more prickly with everybody. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> But, you know, <laughs> basically, I was at San Diego just before I came back to comics in 82. And, and um, both Shooter and Giordano came and asked me, would I do something? And I said, no, I'm, I'm, I was working at Atari at the time. And, I, you know, I said, no, I'm doing game design. And I got home and that Sunday night, um, I got a call from my boss at Atari. And he said, I think they're going to sell the company and we're all going to get fired on Wednesday. <laughs> So Monday morning, I called up uh, Shooter and Giordano, and I said, actually, you know, I, I, I might be able to do something for you. But they both asked me, and I said from the start, I said, you know, I, because I'd been, a, you know, I'd been a Marvel guy until things went south over there. And then I went over to D.C. long enough 
in some ways too long, <laughs> but uh, you know, I mean, I had I had um, connections with both of them at that point, and I, you know, and I said to both of them, I'm going to write for both of you, and uh, Giordano had no problem with that. I don't, I, and I think Shooter. You know, I mean, I I was getting me back was a was a get for Marvel. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, so Shooter wasn't gonna like throw throw um, obstacles in my way. If I was gonna write three books for him and one book for the other company, that you know, that wasn't gonna bother him. And 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 you know, Giordano was was just glad to sort of get you know get me at all rather that that I wasn't just working exclusively for the other guys, you know? So, um, I just, that's, I just, you know, I was in a position to say, this is what I want to do. And they were, yeah. you know, it's like, sure. Okay, fine. You know, so. You're, You're Steve demand. Englehart. That's why. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we actually have a, a chat question here. Uh, yeah. it says, uh, Steve, what, what's it like knowing you invented Todd McFarlane? In a basement. <laughs> I did it in a basement. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, it's, but it, you know, I mean, there's always new guys coming in, and and <laughs> I was looking for an artist, and he was a new guy, and and so I gave him the job, and and he used to always call me Mr. Englehart, like some other people that I know, um, <laughs> and I kept saying, you know, just call me Steve, whatever, but. Um, he was very, you know, he was very shy and humble in those days, just trying to get his foot in the door. And then he became Todd McFarlane. I mean, you know, that happens to a lot of people in any industry. You, you're doing whatever you need to do to get your foot in the door. And then if you can show them that you can do something, then you, you start the road to where it matters who you are, you know? Yeah. Um, that was on Coyote? Was it? It was in Coyote. I, there was Coyote. a backup. We had a backup feature in, in the Coyote book. And I think... We did. I know we did Scorpio Rose with him, mm -hmm. and I and I almost have the feeling that we did one or two issues that were more coyote oriented in there. Um, but yeah, it was mostly Scorpio Rose um, character I own, um, and you know, I mean, I started. I was doing. The, uh, Avengers with a new guy named George Perez at one point too. I mean, you know, it's yeah, like yeah. guys come in. I did a couple issues of Master of Kung Fu with a new guy named Paul Galassi. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. like you people come, people go. I, you know, I've said before that because I started out trying to be an artist and then took a turn and went off to writing, that I always really liked working with artists. And the more artists, the better. And that, you know, I did a lot of work, and so I worked with a lot of artists. Um, but, um, you know, I would say that I really liked work, you know, seeing new guys come along. I wrote a thing uh, for one of the introductions to the masterworks about the Avengers stuff that you could see George Perez get demonstrably better month by month, you know, oh, yeah. from, from when he started to six months later, he was, he'd become demonstrably better. That's fun to watch. But I also really liked doing the Justice League with Dick Dillon, who'd been around mm -hmm. forever. I, you know, I mean, because Dick Dillon had been around forever on the Justice League. I, you know, it was fun for me to come and work with him, too. So um, I have no prejudice one way or the other. I just like to see, you know, good art from whoever's going to provide it, you know. It, it, it just just thinking of just thinking of your Avengers run. Uh, I got to talk to baby Thanos about this. R Steve, what do you think? Roy Thomas's run into Englehart's run, but how that just that that those string of issues, how how incredible was that? Like, to, how incredible was that? Like, it, just if you think of those stories, I mean, I don't know if there's much better. I mean, like that is like the. the I know well, Englehart. You're just gonna have to listen. Whenever um oh, I, whenever I'm uh, in a position where I'm, <laughs> I'm supposed to be sending or giving people advice, and someone will come in and they're like. I want to buy one trade paperback of the Avengers. I'm always like, oh, maybe two? Can we get yeah. you two? Okay. Oh. Uh, because, you know, the Roy Thomas era and the Steve Englehart era of Avengers are 
oh. dripping with history and continuity. You oh. have two masters, and anyone who is of a certain reading level, a certain oh. knowledge level, they <laughs> when they read that, they are impressed because they're like, "Wow, they really put those pieces together. That's incredible. That's that was forty issues ago. That's incredible. That's the type of readership, and that builds." The fanatical reading of, a, of, of a, what they used to call a Marvel zombie, okay? And yeah. it's fanatical. Ooh. And as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. when you see, if it's a graph of the content and quality, it goes Roy and Steve. It just goes across. Oh, there isn't it, a thing, there is, it's just two masters of their craft. I, it, I, 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 I lay my case. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. I know. And Steve, if you have to think about this, like, you are such a part of, like, like the whole MCU. I mean, just so much of your stuff and Roy stuff. I see obviously Starlin too, but like, I mean, just saying like, how do you feel? I, I, everybody should hear this. And I want you to sit from you, Steve, Mr. Engelhart, you have to say, I mean, you are so responsible for the greatest movie franchise in the history of human beings, like of the world. How does that feel? I mean, like, you, your 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 sprinkles are all over that. Like it's incredible. Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you a story before I actually answer that question. When I went to the premiere of the Shang Chi movie in L.A. on Hollywood Boulevard, the whole thing, you know, um, I came out of the theater after seeing the movie, and I was just sort of standing on Hollywood Boulevard, and somebody said to me, "How does it feel that all of this is because of you?" Yeah, and I, I had never really looked at it from that standpoint before, and I'm sure that all of them don't necessarily uh, understand that concept. But if Starlin and I hadn't thought about Shang Chi, then all those guys wouldn't have been making that movie and and all that good stuff. That said, um, you know, I thought roy's avengers was like the best avengers i mean as a reader i'm i was like that's those are great issues issue after issue those that's great stuff and i was certainly surprised when roy said he was going to give it up and he wanted me to take it over you know oh. i mean because i was only i was only a few months into into being a writer at marvel you know i did the beast and then the next two were Captain America and the Defenders, which I also took over from Roy. Um, and then the Avengers, I think, was like the fourth book. And 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 I thought Roy's stuff was fabulous. So it was like, A, why would you pick me? And B, I better get busy. Um, <laughs> um, and I, this is a story I've told a lot, but I, I, for the first several issues, I tried to do what in my head sounded like Roy Thomas stories. You know, I mean, I was trying to hit those same notes. And you guys seem to have thought that it worked out okay, but I oh. it felt it felt incomplete in, you know, just somehow not there because I hadn't yet figured out that I should be doing Steve Englehart stories, you know? In fact, I hadn't really figured out what Steve Englehart stories were at that point, you know? Um, uh, and then, and then I did, you know? And then, <laughs> and then I sort of said, okay, well, I feel more comfortable telling this kind of story and sort of, and sort of moved it away. But again, what I tried to do when anything, whether I took over a book or whether I was six months into it and still figuring out what I was doing, I, it's supposed to connect. That was the Marvel universe was supposed to connect. Right. And that's easy to do. I was only 10, it was only 10 years in to the Marvel universe when I came along. Right. I mean, um, so it, I was writing the same Thor, the same Captain America, the same, you know, vision, which that already existed. And now it was my turn to see what I could do with those people. But the continuity was, was, you know, that was a given. You were supposed to do that. And I liked doing that. I liked, you know, as you say, going back 40 issues and finding something. But I totally understand you can't go back 40 years <laughs> and do that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you can't. 
continuity sort of had to die after a while because it just had been going on too long and you were making reference to stuff that most of your readership didn't have access to and so on and so forth. So again, it was part of the era that I could do, you know, that. Uh, but my intention again was to honor what had been done. Um, I wanted my Thor you know, to be a good representation of the Thor that we all had seen. Um, right. <laughs> you know, so uh, as I say, I tried I tried to do stories like Roy would do them, and then I started doing my own stories, but I hoped that they would be, you know, of the same level somehow, oh. just coming at it from a different a different angle. And and, yeah. j and really quick, it's, we we talk about even we make Roy blush too about the genius of Roy. I mean, he does things so spur of the moment; it's like no big deal to him. But he had the foresight to know that you had the potential to do just as good as a joke. Like, and that's I mean that shows you how good of an editor he was. He would see his talent, and then he knows what would work. And you know, you yeah. doing defenders after, and he was right. I mean. <laughs> The one thing that you, I have to say is like, okay, you, you only had like 10 years of continuity, but the, the difference today is the characters should still be the same. You can show, show they, they went high and low and did that stuff, but Thor should still always be Thor. Captain America should be Captain America. The core essence of those characters are still there. Well, they should still be there. And that's where, that's what the difference is today is like, they're not even the same. At least you knew. Once again, and it was just so simple to write Thor, your version of Thor, but he was Thor. When he spoke, he still spoke like so radical. So go ahead, Steve. Go ahead. I, it's just crazy. <laughs> yeah, crazy. as I said, I mean, obviously there's that that golden era that you, oh. when you break through from when you're, you know, you're finding your feet, you're doing very well. But I always love to remind people that, the sheer amount of work you did in the 1980s also has to be read, examined because it's magnificent. You came back after a period where you, you know, you had been like dormant in that business and all of a sudden quite quickly, you know, <laughs> you're doing West coast Avengers, you're doing a silver surfer, you're doing the fantastic fall, which we talked about at length before, which is one of my oh. favorites of all time. You're doing Green, Green Lantern. And then, you know, you even get to do your own massive crossover over at DC, uh, Millennium. So yeah. a tremendous workload of material in the 80s as well. Because a lot of people, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I like the 70s stuff, la, la, la. I'm like, uh, 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 hold on a second. <laughs> hold on a second, okay? Uh, again, uh, a master of your craft. But that was an amazing body of work that you did in the 1980s. Um and then you got up to the early 1990s and then you, of, of course, ended up working over, uh, you know, with Malibu and the Ultraverse, you know. So it's just a continuation of creativity. So if anyone looks at your career and they can say, well, look, he did this, he did that. He went off to another publisher. He went and did this. Uh, mm -hmm. When you look back, you know, over the decades, what is your favorite era that you were working in? Uh, I know that's probably a really tough question, but was it when you felt like you were really comfortable or is it when you felt like, oh, I'm breaking through and I'm trying to learn some stuff? I would think the, I would think that I would, I mean, I, writing involves sitting by yourself in a room. And if you're not entertaining yourself, <laughs> it's pretty, you know, it's pretty deadly sitting alone in that room. Plus you're probably <laughs> then not entertaining the readers, which means you'll get fired. Um, so, you know, I liked, I always found a way, almost always found a way to make what I was doing entertaining to me and hopefully to you. Um, but I would say my favorite era would be the 70s because then I was breaking in and, you know, everything was new and everything, you know, and I was, mm -hmm. I was working in the Marvel offices and, and I mean, for a while and then I wasn't, but. Um, just I'd been a you know I'd been a comic fan in general. Marvel was my favorite company, but I mean I read all the DCs, I read all the Gold Keys, I read 
all the romance books from everybody. I read all the West. I mean, it's like, I just love comics in general. Um, but Marvel superheroes was my favorite and, 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 um, getting a chance to do something there and then finding out that they liked what I did. And then they start giving me more and, and each new character is new to me at that point. Right. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm getting my chance to write all these guys that I've admired for so long. Um, so that was, you know, that was just, there was something happening every, every minute in the eighties and nineties. By then I was a professional you know, I mean, you know, um, I still really liked it. I, I, you probably heard when I was going on about Green Lantern, how much fun it was to do Green Lantern in the 80s, you know, and I would say doing Strangers and Nightman um, at Malibu, same deal. And even doing Avengers Celestial Quest in the early 2000s for, yeah, us, I for, for Vork, you know, I mean, yeah. it's like, if I'm doing it, I'm trying to make it you know, fun for everybody involved, including me. Um, but the seventies was just, you know, magical because it was all new. Yeah. Uh, it was, yeah, it was such, it was so refreshing. Go ahead now. All right. So what I would like to do actually is we've got three good uh, chat questions. I'd like to bring up for you, if you don't mind. Uh, the first one's from uh, leg kick one. Uh, what was your favorite work, Steve? The, I liked them all. I really, I mean, you know, I, I cannot say, Batman was more fun than Captain America was more fun than Dr. Strange was more, you know, I mean, it's like, like I said, you know, if I was doing it, I was trying to make it as much fun as I understood fun, you know, as possible. So, you know, I really can't say, Oh, that guy was my favorite out of all of them because they were all different. And so each one was fun for me to, you know, I mean, Exploring Bruce Wayne's psyche is different from exploring Steve Rogers' psyche. Is different from you know Steve Strange's psyche, um, and and so forth. So sorry, I got no particular favorite. All right, and then uh, Comics for Life asked, "Do you think Jim Shooter is vilified? Today's books could use his editorial decision making nowadays." Yes and no. I mean, Shooter was hired to make the trains run on time. People had gotten sloppy. Uh, they weren't, they were missing their deadlines. They needed somebody like that over at DC. It was Mort Weisinger back in the day. Right. I mean, you know, somebody who would, who would crack the whip. Oh, yeah. um, I think Shooter was a little too fond of cracking whips, you know, and, and alienated a lot of people. I mean, on the one hand, he had to push people to get them to do what they needed to do. On the other hand, he was not always the most pleasant guy uh, to deal with. So there are a lot of people who don't like Jim Shooter. I've uh, on balance, I was fine with him, but I had, you know, I had some run ins with him, mostly later at Valiant. Um, uh, but um, so, yeah, he's vilified. And I would say to some extent he deserves it, but I wouldn't call him a villain. You know, I wouldn't move him completely over into that category. Okay, and then uh, I just want to pop this one up real quick before the last question. Uh, little Jimmy Fireball says, your Avengers run got me into comics. Thanks for all the great stories. Thank you, little Jimmy. All right, and then <laughs> Comics for Life then asked, uh, which artist do you feel drew what you put in words into art best? Well, all of them did, you know, but I'm not going to duck that question quite so much. Uh, I did... Mostly, I mean, mostly people who are comic book artists are competent comic book artists. You know, some of them are better artists than others or whatever. I was always just happy to, to be working with whoever. Every, not always. There was once or twice I did a series. I'm not going to mention names at all, but I did a series where the art just was really like dead on the page. It just like it was like statues. Everybody was a statue. And I could see that. And I, you know, and I, I you know, it's like, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I, you know, that's not, that's not doing it for me, but in general, and, and, you know, I always say my favorite two were, were Sal Buscema on one side of town and Joe Staten on the other side of town. Cause they, you know, and I mean, I worked with George Perez and I worked with John Buscema and I worked with all these other guys and I, you know, they're all good and I really liked them. But from the particular way you put that question, I could talk, I could come up with anything. And I always, I say this about Sal because he was the first one. 
Roy gave me complete, gave all of us complete creative freedom to do whatever we wanted to do. But if I was working with an artist who said, well, I can't really draw horses and I, you know, and, and I'm not real good on space stuff. And if I had to start like working in a smaller bubble because yeah. my artist couldn't handle it, I wouldn't have been as creatively free as I, you know, as it turned out I was, you know. So the fact that I could say to Sal, let's do this. And Sal would go, sure, I'll draw that. You know, exactly the same way with state. Sure, I'll draw that. Um, and the fact that then it came out looking as nice as it did with those guys. Mm. You know, I mean, um, people, I, you know, I know the consensus at the time was that John Buscema was, was better than Sal Buscema. And I, I honestly liked Sal better. Um, he wasn't quite the draftsman of his brother, but he was, you know, he was a good draftsman and he was just a lot of fun to work with. Yeah. Oh. It's like cool. those. Was there another one now? Is there another nope. one? No. No. Thanks for the questions. Yeah. That the okay. working well, with Sal, um, I think produced some of the real magic, especially on Captain America. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love the Defenders. I really do. But that Captain America that you guys created was far more dynamic than there had been, and ever since, as far as I'm concerned. I mean. Doesn't matter who if they were. Doesn't matter who they were fighting. But the way that you were obviously describing things, when he was throwing his shield around, and I know John. I know John noticed immediately that shield would be banging around, you know, the alleyways, and people would be like, "What in the hell?" You know, it was just so incredibly dynamic, and people were just getting blitzed by that shield. And for some strange reason, you know, once you left the title, and then it, you know, it carried on. It was like, they, you know, it was like they forgot that Steve could throw the shield. It's like, you know, he can throw, you know, you're not going to hide. You can't, if you're running away, it's like, ba -da -ba -ba bang, and the shield would go past. And, you know, I didn't realize that until years and years ago, someone came up to me and he was like, yeah, I love the Captain America run, the Engelhart run. And I thought he was going to come up against something really deep. And he goes, I just love the way that shield would ping around and just <laughs> smack right into people's faces. And I was like, yes, yes. I said, you couldn't get away from his shield. I don't care who you were. So uh, hopefully anyone who's watching this right now it's so true you want to see real Captain America action, Steve Englehart's Alba Sema. <laughs> yeah, it, and, it, yeah, I was gonna say, I mean, Steve Englehart could think that stuff up, but the visuals are Sal's, right? And, yeah. and mm -hmm. if you really like the visuals, that's because Sal was really good at that stuff. You know? Yes. hundred oh, percent. It, it's so funny you say that, Steve, because I, I it's it's so true, and how these things I I know I know Ingle, Mr. Englehart I know it drives you nuts, but these are like the the Polaroids of me and Steve's life. Like we live our lives through these the words, especially especially the seventies. Yes, we love Jack Kirby, we love Stan. I mean, you, you can't and Dicko, all that stuff. But there's something so magical and refreshing about the because you started now refining all these heroes and you started giving them more a little more depth and a substance from what Stan did originally. You started with Roy and then you guys, yeah. you know, all the way to Claremont. I mean, it, it just it, it was just such a and just you could tell the freshness because all those newer those 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 you know, out of Roy's tenure, all those newer characters that started coming up and all that stuff, and like like your beast. Oh my God, your beast, especially in those Hulk issues with the mimic yeah. and all that stuff. Oh my God, I, I and the I know I say this to all the time, but the Wendigo. Oh, I'm so in <laughs> love with the Wendigo. <laughs> the, and Steve, how do you feel that the Wendigo is now as white as your beard? How does that feel? How does that feel? What? That my beard has <laughs> turned white? Or the, the Wendigo? Almost, he always was white. Um, but. No, but I'm just saying, like, the, but you can see, I, and I know to you, it's just, and, and like Roy and that stuff, it's just kind of like, oh, yeah, we were just, you know, just writing comics. But it was so, it was so unbelievable. And because you had that freedom to do what you want, like, to, to kind of do it the way you want it, and, you know, and you were going to honor these heroes, it, it, it just showed. You don't have that type of freedom like anymore, like in any time, it's very difficult for any, because now today with all these comic, the comic, you know, they got, they have, you know, it, it's a lot more licensing, you know, everybody's right. looking to be the next movie. It's a little hard, but you guys were at that stage, like 
you know, you guys were just writing comics, but like you didn't know if these, you know, sure there was toys and all that stuff, but it was still kind of like a, a niche medium, medium yeah. kind of like, and you guys with that freedom. Oh, and I think you and you, Roy, Chris, and like Len and Marv, I mean, like I said, they're the I don't have to look at pictures. I just have to look at your comics. And I'm like, I know what I was doing then. I know what I was doing then. You know, it just, it just, yeah, sorry, go, go ahead, Steve. Go. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I think it's important, you know, to realize the John fell out of his chair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's well, important to realize, you know, crazy. just the, the amount of impact. And that's one of the things that's definitely missing from today because um, I don't hear anyone talking about specific panels or something that's going on. Everyone oh. talks about a cover. They said, did you see the variant cover from such and such? But back in our day, you know, we would say, wow, do you see that issue? The Hulk, you know, Defenders 10, when the Hulk grabs Thor's cape, and oh. get, you know, twist him in the ground. And so I go, yeah, yeah. And you'd have a deep conversation about that. Now, that was something that when you're writing and you're writing for the moment, you know, you may be under the deadline. You're like, OK, I've got to get this done. La, la, la. OK, boom, get sent off that little piece of history right there goes into our brains and it's there forever <laughs> so anyone from our generation i and someone can say do you remember that issue yeah and like yeah remember he ground him right into the concrete that's the type of magic that you created but i don't see from the modern stuff happening today i don't you know maybe i'm i mean niall can probably speak to this a little better because he's more in touch with the modern but niall do, do you hear anyone talking like that of, a, of the today's generation about the today's you, writers? You don't want me talking about today's. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want. But do it, bringing that up though, I, I I actually would like to ask Steve though, since we're kind of on that topic though. So in we had a good conversation with Howard Chaik in, in regards to this, and I kind of want to get your opinion too. Is you know writers like yourself? I mean you. You, you know, your job was to, to, to know what the fans want, get the stories going, you know, making sure really that they were escaping into the into the stories, into the worlds, the universes. Then the fans job really was to turn the page and to keep going and staying interested and giving their feedback, you know, when they mailed in and whatnot. No, but do you feel 12 cents? Yeah, paying the 12 cents, right? Uh, but do you feel with t in, in today's world? I don't know how deep you're into it now, how, how well you're staying up to it, though. But do you think today's comic book industry has lost its connection with the fans? Um, that's a tough question. I, I totally agree that the business is, is totally different now. Um, if you, I mean, I've had people being incredulous that Roy just said, here, you write Captain America now. You know, it's like, end of story. Um, I could do anything I wanted to with Captain America and was supposed to because it wasn't doing very well at that point in time. But um, um, ask me again. <laughs> <laughs> ask me the question again. Do, do you believe it's uh, oh, do, you be that, yeah. um, do you believe that the, the comic book industry has lost touch with its fans? Well, it has in numbers certainly i mean we sold mm -hmm. basically three quarters of a million to a million copies of everything ever um, yeah. you know and now they sell thirty thousand or whatever they sell so yeah. i mean i think most of the interest among people who are interested has gone to the movies right and and so the books um aren't driving the conversation anymore um i think that leads to that and the many layers of editorial interference or whatever you want to call it leads to what can we do to get somebody to buy this book this month and then we'll you know and we're not worried about continuity or or staying the same or whatever you know let's turn the whole purple now you know and see if if that'll get somebody to buy the book it's they're operating those guys I don't, you know, I don't know any of the people who are doing comics these days, but they're operating under a very different set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know what it would, you know, I don't, I can't imagine what it feels like to write a book that only 30,000 people are going to see, you know? 
because uh, and those are very those are with and yeah. Steve, those are with variant covers included. <laughs> so it's not yeah, like, yeah, those numbers so, include all the variant. Yeah. 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 So. I mean, I, I I just would say this is a story that'll make almost no sense to the people hearing this, but there was a guy, the guy who was on the Tonight Show when I was a little kid was Steve Allen. And Steve yeah. Allen, he took over from way too he was before Jack Parr, who was before Johnny Carson. Um, but Steve Allen was kind of a fifties hip guy. I mean, he was into jazz. He, you know, he, he was just a New Yorker who was kind of one of the fifties hip guys. And as a kid, you know, watching him on TV, I, I thought, I, I like this guy, you know, a lot of people like this guy. Um, and then when he got old, he took out an, you know, and he'd been off TV for 20 years or whatever. He took out full page ads in the newspapers saying television has gone to hell. It used to have standards. And now it's, you know, these days television, you know, it was the equivalent of these kids today thing, you know. And I and I, as a young person still, I looked at that and I said, don't do that. <laughs> don't, you know, don't get old and start going. Yeah, well, in my day, things, were, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's like, no, dude. I mean, uh, so I'm I'm I. I give them, I give people doing comics today all the uh, slack in the world because they're having to work under very different conditions. I'm not a fan of a lot of the stuff that comes out, uh, but that's because it's not hitting all the cylinders that I would like it to hit. I may be wrong about what cylinders it ought to hit, you know, mm. uh, but, uh, but I'm certainly not going to say, yeah, well, comics were great in my day and then you know you guys it, it's just different it, you know as I, as I talked about continuity and stuff before i mean i had i had various things to play with which are no longer there i had the freedom to play with things which is no longer there um so you know i can't i can't diss those guys yeah. I'd like to yeah. tie this that question I gave you into kind of with a, a chat question that came up, and it says, "If you were put in charge of Marvel today, what would be your game plan?" Oh, you know, that's obviously completely hypothetical. I uh... <laughs> he's like, oh, and then rolls out the big book. Well, <laughs> um, well, I you know I would try to recapture uh, the freedom to, to to go you know to take established characters and find new things to do with them as them, as opposed to reinventing them, uh, you know, every six months. Um, I would try to do that, but then I don't know how many barriers I would have to overcome to make that happen, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, the whole, the whole Marvel universe, which is now the Marvel cinematic universe, still a great idea. You know, I mean, it's still, all credit to Stan, you know, for, for, for running with that and making that happen. Yep. Um, I, I don't think the comics today necessarily do much in the way of, they don't do as much in the way of the universe. And, and so there's no reason conceptually why the Marvel universe couldn't be as wide ranging and interesting as the Marvel cinematic universe course but actually doing that who you know i'm sure i see a lot of people saying no <laughs> to me <laughs> you know yeah. it's well okay. they were using all your stuff to make the movies so, you know so <laughs> yeah. they made a great cinematic universe with all the stuff that you know you did and your peers did well yeah that's that's the whole thing it's like yeah, yeah we're, we're really using this stuff but they, it's almost sleight of hand but we don't want you to know that we're making all this <laughs> new stuff we're just putting like little cherries on top but steve speaking of my boy over here reminded something on me when he was talking about the Hulk versus Thor and that whole Avengers Defenders thing. I always wanted to ask you, tell me the whole nucleus and making of that and how you decided on like going to do the, like the, the comics. Because that was a big radical thing at that time, putting the Defenders and the Avengers together, especially the Defenders were, you know, they were just starting their series. Tell me, tell me. Tell me the hist like the making of that, I, and how you decided who was going to fight who. This, it was, I always wanted to ask you this. Well, 
Marvel had done summer specials for the last previous several years, you know, which was always cool. And you get a 25 cent book and it had a big news story and it had a reprint from back in the day when, you, you know, hard to see examples of early Avengers stories or whatever. And then they decided they weren't going to do it that summer. Um, and I thought, well, the fans are, are used to having some sort of big ticket item here in the summertime. I'm writing both the Avengers and the Defenders. I could do this oh. thing, you know? And so I went to Roy and I said, I want to do this thing. And he, and he, the only question, the only thing he said to me was, if you screw up any deadline in those books, you will throw everything out of whack. And I said, I won't do that. Oh. That's, you know, and that was, you know, that was good enough for Roy. And that's, you know, so I Look didn't do that. that. Um, yeah. um, so then I sat down. And, and again, you know, I had these many Avengers and these many Defenders and which ones, you know, which would make good storylines between these two guys. And then those six fights, what order would they go in and how would that work and how could I, you know, I mean, all that stuff, that's all part of, you know, oh, so doing good. things. Um, and, you know, and so... That's what we did. I mean, we did this thing that ran all summer long with this storyline between all these guys. And the, the caveat to that, I mean, going back to my friend Mantis there, um, I had, and I didn't realize this for years. It took me a long time before I kind of looked back and went, oh, um, she was brought in to cause dissension in the Avengers. She was going to be this, this <laughs> prostitute from Saigon who was going to like, <laughs> you know, it's like Meghan Markle in the royal family. <laughs> yes. Oh, you know? we don't, oh, we don't use the M word. Oh, you know, um, she was that's she was going to be disruptive. And right after I introduced her is when I said, "Hey, Roy, I think I'll do an Avengers Defenders thing." And so, when I'm putting together those battles, she's got to be in there, and she's got to like do something legit. She, I mean, she's not being going to be seducing people in the middle of the Avengers Defenders War. So she became a teammate. You know, she became competent as an Avenger at that point because of the structure that I had built with the Avengers Defenders thing. And that changed her, sent her off on this whole different trajectory from what I had thought I was going to do with it, you know? Um, but we talked before. I mean, all that stuff is like, hadn't been done before. Now I'm doing it. You know, it's like, it was fun. It was just fun. To, oh, to work with you, guys. and I love how it 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 it, 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 it all came to uh, that of uh, that Defenders Ten, the Hulk first store, and I look, I just have to, and I love how you said, I never forgot this as a kid. The two true royal heavyweights on each team was mm. Thor and the Hulk, but and then how they all had to be like. We kind of all figured it out, but the Hulk and the Thor are fighting. We gotta go see, you know, we gotta save the city, which was incredible. But you, I just have to say this dialogue that you said uh, when Thor faces with the faces off with the Hulk, and you have Thor goes, though the last time we fought, I no one truly won. He goes, I did prove to be your superior, and the Hulk goes, superior. Are you saying you are better than Hulk? Like he kind of figured it out. I was just like, Steve, you have to understand. I'm reading that stuff and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm screaming. I'm screaming. And like, that was so incredible. But it was the fact that you had all these battles, like I said, and then you knew to accumulate it, like to have the main event there. And it was just, and how, it was just so magical how all the other heroes had to get into it. And then they stopped them from fighting. You know, they ended in their draw. And everything, but like Steve, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think this also goes into a wider picture. And I, oh. I remember reading a long, long time ago, I don't know whether it was in the comics journal or, or, or Amazing Heroes, but you just said, oh. I write comics that you know that I would want to read, mm. and oh. You know the fan base when you you read the early, you know the first times that the thing met the Hulk, you know back in the day, it gave you a little thrill, and now it's your turn because you had an idea of what's making you happy that it's going to make the fans happy, and that ability. I don't know if that if that story was done today, you know whether the the reaction would be the same. It would just be probably like, 
you know, they'd be in online chat and they'd be like, well, yeah, okay, you know, whatever. Okay. Uh, but for us back then, it meant a big deal. And basically, yeah, you know, you're not an editor or anything, but when you're sitting there writing and you're going, all right, we're going to, you know, oh, we, we're going to have to have Thor and Hulk. We can, this is, this is going to, this is going to blow their minds. You wait till they see Okay. Did. That's how I envision you writing it. And so I don't know. I, I can just imagine you when the full issue comes out and it hasn't been read by anyone yet. You're going, Oh, you wait till they see this. You know, <laughs> I just envision, I don't know whether that was true for you, but I, that's, that's how I envision it. Well, that's how I probably felt inside. I mean, doing it, I wasn't like walking around going, oh boy, <laughs> this is going to be a thing. But I mean, I knew it was a thing. I knew, you know, I I was, I understood those characters. I, I understood Marvel. I understood comics. So it's like, yeah, that'll be a thing. Um, but that was, you know, part and parcel of just, you know, I'm doing the big thing, the Avengers Defenders thing. And this is the part that fits here. And then, and these two guys, you know, it's not, you know, it's not Thor versus Mantis. It's Thor versus the Hulk. And, you know, oh. you know. But there's also, there's subtleties that maybe today people wouldn't get, i.e. Loki and Dormammu. Quite quickly mm. you realize, wait a minute, Dormammu is at another level here. I mean, Loki's like a little, you know, snidey little fox going, oh, no, 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 no. And Dormammu's like, yeah. And before that, you didn't quite realize that because Dormammu had always been like with Doctor Strange or whatever it was. And suddenly you have this hyper powerful Asgardian god that's like, oh, Dormammu, are you going to help me? And so when I was reading it, I was like, whoa, Dormammu is more powerful than I imagined. I was like, I wonder if Dormammu could take on Odin. You know, that's the type of stuff that, you, oh. that goes on like that. And that little subtlety that you created right there has impact because then after that you know there's a hierarchy and you got the hierarchy and that's the way you wrote it I just did you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. we're just throwing we're just throwing it up to you Steve. Right. hey and, and i have to admit when you open up that first page of number 10 first off one of the greatest covers of all time you know ramita did an incredible hulk and thor but yeah. when you open it up and you just see the hulk walking in the city and like you know the salvo sama stuff i'm just saying uh, my last question about that when when it was all said and done first number one was roy happy you made all those deadlines and how 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 did the the how did the bullpen react to it i mean that was great stuff yeah i mean well again roy when he gave me Captain America, he said, you have to turn this in on time every month and it has to sell. And if those happen, you can keep doing it. And if one or the other or both doesn't happen, we'll just fire you and get somebody else. And that was really the last editorial directive I got from Roy. Just, you know, hit your deadlines and, and sell the books, you know? I mean, so I'm, I'm sure Roy was happy uh, you know, about the fact that I made the deadlines and, and sold the books, you know, and, 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 uh, I know, Steve, yeah, I know you, you look know, at it from, I, you're right. I know you look at it from such a normal angle, but like those books were, when I was supposed to go left, I went right. When I would go up, I went down. They, they had such an impact on my life that like decisions I made forever were based on those stories. I know it sounds crazy, but, but it really was. That's the type of impact. Look at these. You made these two set. Niall, you know, he's a little more normal, but this, this savage over here, these two right here, you, you destroyed us, but we actually did pretty good in life. But like, it was those things that made, okay. I know this sounds weird, Steve, but, Steve, tell me this. We can just be doing something, and all of a sudden we can see, like one of those comics there, thousands that come through Torpedo, and you just have to look through it, and you just have to skim through it. And we must have skimmed through it a million times during our lifetime, but it just, everything stops. you got to pick that up, and you'll just be like, oh, my God, this was so awesome. And we must have read it like a thousand times. I mean, what other, there's not many other, like, mediums, you know, video games or something that just, that, that that 
that has such a timeless thing that like you can always pick up those 30 pages or 25 pages and read it over and over or even just skim it. I mean, it's just incredible what your work has done. Oh, like, oh, it, I know I'm blathering, babbling, but I mean, it's just, it just did so, I mean, it's just, it, they were so, they're so powerful. And we always knew that. And now obviously the world knows that because look, look, I mean, you had to have done something more than just banging through. Cause look, I mean, the whole world, You've made how many billions of dollars did you, Roy, Stan, like make make Disney? I mean, that's that's crazy. And you think about that, you know. I mean, does your wife ever go? Does your wife ever say like sometimes like Jesus or like people around you? I'd be knocking on your window. You changed the world. <laughs> you changed the world. <laughs> you know, I just was in the right place at the right time. I was oh. lucky. You know, I was lucky. It was a great era. I was the right age, the right place, and and you know, turned out I had the ability to do something with it, you know. But well, but um, the the weird thing to me, because again, my beard has turned white, right? But I'm but I'm still I'm still in good shape. I'm not yeah, you know, yeah. I'm not over the end over the edge yet. Uh, it's weird to see something that you did as we were saying earlier, just, you know, doing comics for comic book people for that to become history in a sense, history. you know, to wow. become something that people, you know, I mean, it's like if, 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 you know, if somebody came up to you and said, you know, that, that book report you did in the 11th grade, we still talk about that all the time. <laughs> it would be weird, wouldn't it? You know, um, <laughs> Uh, it's, it's just been fortuitous. It's been, a, you know, just a lucky ride. Um, and I, you know, I used to just say, well, I'm just standing here and people go, well, actually you did something. And it's like, yeah, I did, you know, but I mean, yeah, yes. uh, so much of it was just because I wanted to do it and I was there to do it and, and, and had a good time doing it. And, and you never, had the talent. I never expected any of this, you know. But the other good thing is, Steve, is that your product, all the stuff that you created, it's out there. Yeah, it I is. have a lot of friends who, when they ask me for reading suggestions, they don't buy trade paperbacks or comics. They're going online and they're reading reams and reams of material. It's all available. It's all there. Yeah, it is. And, you know, again, there, there must be a sense of pride. You know, the people who are going on there and they're like, they're reading, they're going to go through, they're going to reread, you know, the Stan and the Roy and the Steve, you know, and specifically, you know, uh, when they were like, maybe they watched one division and they were like, oh, what, all the stuff about the human, you know, and they go through and they're like, oh, you know, it's all available now. It's yeah. all there, all that classic material. There's no reason why you can't read. Uh, it, the entire Marvel universe online right now, and also the DC universe. My hope, and I'm, I'm, I don't know, maybe the other uh, guys here share it with me, is that there's a young person out there right now that's going through and reading that material, that amazing source material, that's going to break into the industry at some point, right now, and say, by the way, Steve was going in a tangent and he didn't quite finish it, but I have an idea. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That's what I'm hoping for. Well, but see, I was I was that guy reading all the stuff that was available to be read. And I said, yeah, I like this. I want to go in that direction, you know. So I hope that, you know, me and everybody else managed, you know, we all managed to influence somebody somewhere. And, I, and I'll say, we sort of went past this before, but being in the mass market, back in the day, three quarters of a million of everything, you know, up to a million if things really went off. Um, I, again, I looked at it as like, I'm writing these comics and Marvel's publishing them and people are saying nice things about them. They're sending letters, you know, blah, blah, blah. I go to conventions, people would say nice, you know, but, you know, I've had letters and I'm sure Roy has, I'm sure everybody has had letters from people going, I was in a really dark place. My dad had done this and I was thinking, you know, and I read your comic and it kind of changed yeah. my life, you know, 
And then I go, oh, yeah, you, when you send stuff into the mass market, mm -hmm. it's the market. There's all yes, these people, yeah. you know? I mean, um, I, I dropped this in because it fits my story. But, I mean, Paul McCartney went up to the Marvel offices once looking for me. But I was in California, so I was <laughs> I was told about this afterwards, right? McCartney liked my stuff, and he came by, and so well, McCartney was part of the mass audience, you know. Oh, yeah, it's like, mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I'm slow on the uptake sometimes, you know, and sort of thinking, oh yeah, there's half a million people out there who are reading this thing, you know. Uh, if I'd really thought about it, it might have freaked me out, but uh, yeah. but uh, it, but it's strong enough to last forever. I mean, like. Like where there were like writings on walls to like, you know, like that, that stuff that especially it, that st st the, you know, the 60s and 70s, especially that generation, like those are works that are going to be forever. Like, I mean, I know it might be hard to put your, your mind around that, but it really will be. Those will be, those are like treasure troves. Those are like mythology now of stories that people like, look at me and Steve, like, and then people that we know, we just blather this on to people that'll listen who won't listen. But they, you know, not for nothing. But me and Steve are kind of influential because we're so powerful and like and crazy about it. But but people listen to what we say and they'll pick up like, well, you know, he is enthusiastic about that. Maybe I should try that. And we're not the only ones. We're we're millions. So what I'm saying is that stuff is always gonna. It's like a good song. You were talking about the Beatles. That music will always stand the test of time. And every great artist and writer wants their work to live on after they die. And you got, you're got you one of those people that no, they, nothing can ever take that away. And like that credit. That's why I'm so adamant with Roy of him getting his credit and making sure like – I know he loves the money and all that stuff, but I always say, Roy, the legacy, the legacy. Like, you know, like, ah, oh, they gave me this much money. And I'll be like, no, you got to get, I, I, cause I, because you guys deserve that in those names. I mean, especially in the 60s and 70s, those are the names in the hollowed halls of Valhalla. I mean, seriously, you're one of those guys, Steve. I'm sorry. They'll say, and, and it's less and less every generation. You know, a legend they talk about today or like that was, or like from 10 years ago, are they really, I mean, are we really going to, no, it's all like, it's, but your guy's stuff, I'm sorry, is just great. It's just, it's unparalleled. So I know we kept you here for a long time, Steve. So we're going to start wrapping it up. Niall, any uh, last words for uh, Mr. Engelhardt? Well, well, I want to thank you for coming on again. I appreciate it. You know, coming on with us live. I know we did a couple of recorded shows with you. I do have a, a, a question here, if you don't mind, from uh, Comics for Life. Uh, just says, uh, do you think the lack of teacher apprentice relation between an established creator and a new creator contributes to the state of comics nowadays? Yes, I guess I would. Um, I mean, there aren't a whole lot of veterans um, around, you know, again, but there aren't that many jobs to be had either. So, um, but yeah, I think, and, and, because the industry now sort of runs on events rather than continuity, um, people are kind of starting over all the time. So the idea of kind of learning what happened already and learning how it got done, I can remember, I think it was in the 90s. Well, when Steve Gerber and I worked for Ultraverse, um, we, I remember talking with him about it one night that that we could we could we could be the veterans and this is only in the 90s but I mean we could be the veterans who would you know sort of explain to these people you know how how to do it not what to do not do it like us but just like this is the stuff that you need to pay attention to and and, and so forth um, obviously it didn't happen um, so yeah, I mean, I don't get the, I mean, there isn't that sense of a whole Marvel universe that exists in and of itself where you can join it and be part of it and, and learn it. Mm -hmm. It is more event driven now, you know, a lot of mini series, a lot of, um, you know, a writer and artist get together and say, let's do six issues of something. And then, and they do, but there's no sense of like, 
you know, I mean, it, and that's, again, it's different. I'm not saying, you know, any more than that. But certainly, you know, I, would, I was 10 years into the Marvel Universe and I was the third writer on the Avengers. You know, people people signed up for the long haul back in those days. And, and oh, yeah. you know, um, so you, you kind of went into it with the idea of like, I'm going to be writing this book for a long time here. And yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm building something over time and, and so on and so forth. Um, hmm. Which is not usual today. Um, so yes, I would answer the, that question and say, yeah, I think um, the lack of institutional memory, the lack of you know, yes. Answer the question is yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right, Steve. Okay. I want to, uh, yeah, I want to wrap up with one quick question. Uh, I was just reading a story. Uh, Ron Mars has just done a story uh, about Warlock mm -hmm. and what he's done is his story is, you know, it's a, it's, it's a flashback. So he doesn't have to deal with massive amounts of current continuity. Mm -hmm. He's dealing with what he is familiar with, but he's, but he's giving a very interesting story. Is that something that you would still be interested in today if, they, if you could do like a, a six issue or 12 issue miniseries, uh, something that's set in continuity that you know at Marvel? Well, yes, I just got through saying six issue stories suck. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, then a 12 I... issue, it has to be a 12 issue maxi series. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, I, my, enthusiasm for comics and my enthusiasm for Marvel comics and, and some DC, you know, it's like um, it would be fun for me as it always was to, to, you know, to do that again. Again, I think that's a hypothetical. I don't think anybody's, you know, um, I mean, in 2002 or whatever it was, Brevort said, Mantis has gone off the tracks. Come do the Avengers Celestial Quest and, and fix her. Get her back to what she's supposed to be which is kind of what we're talking about here. Um, mm -hmm. That was 20 years ago, you know? So, I mean, I don't, I don't know that it operates that way anymore. Uh, I doubt um, that anybody, you know, would want that. I mean, I don't get the sense that Marvel would really want that. Um, although they might, I don't know. Um, well, the only reason I say that is because there are a certain number of people, let's talk about Kang, for instance. Mm. Kang is a major character now, and Kang is the linchpin of the next 500 years' worth of MCU. Yeah. So if, you know, they can either go to Roger Stern, okay, they can go to Kurt Mosaic, or they can go to you and just say, hey, uh, have you got a Kang story inside you that's interesting, you know? Mm -hmm. It's I true. mean, that's the way I'm thinking, because, you know, if you're going to try and get a good Kang story, why wouldn't you <laughs> Why wouldn't you go there to the masters of their craft instead of some guy that's the barista at Starbucks? Well, um, I can only say it would be fun, um, yeah. uh, but I don't I don't expect it. Um, I mean, I will I, I will hearken back to that early 2000s. Um, they were going to. Marvel was going to take the Ultraverse characters and put them in the Marvel Universe. And they asked me to um, figure out how to do that. And so I did. But part of it wasn't just a question of what are you going to do or what are you going to do in the first issue? It was like, what are you going to do for issues one through 12? And I, you know, I tried my best to answer that question, but I thought at the time, you know, the way I work was so much in the moment. It's it's Avengers week now. What am I going to do with the Avengers this month? That kind of thing. Um, if I were if I were writing issue 12 of a series and all I was doing was checking off boxes about things that I thought I might do a year earlier, that would not be interesting to me. You right. know? So, mm -hmm. so, you know, were I to do something, as you suggest, they would basically have to say, it's yours. Just go do it, you know. And I don't know that they would do that, you know. I mean, there's all there's all this. Um, the editors run thing, as as I understand it, you know. The editors are the guys who were in charge now, 
the writers and artists are working for the editors and the editors are deciding where things are going to go a lot of the time. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, we were our own editors. You know, I mean, it, Roy, Roy had the title, but Roy gave us the power, you know. So. Yeah, you don't have that freedom because of life. It's like you they, they have the borders of the puzzle already made and they just said, like, fill in the puzzle. Like, you know, yeah. like you can't go outside of that. That that's unfortunately that's yeah that's and 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 I have to say that's why because creators get stifled like this you're never going to get their best work you got to let well, them yeah I mean but I think it's a good idea obviously I would but I mean I think if somebody up at one of those places said you know like when they brought Stan over to write all the DC characters it's like you know it's like that would be interesting let's let's do that and and saying. Mm -hmm. These guys don't fit our system, but I bet they could do something interesting. So let's let them give it a shot. You know that. I think that would be enlightened, but I don't think that would happen. You know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Engelhardt, for being with us. Obviously, we're going to have you back again. We do. We can't get enough of you, especially me and Steve. <laughs> we can't. We always want. We always want a little piece. Thank you, and we like to thank everybody for their questions and joining us and stuff. That uh, it's always a pleasure. Oh, and uh, just about that Malibu versus the event, uh, the Avengers. I love how you had Thor kick Prime's butt. I was so happy. I was so, you said he was disgusting to be so, uh, like, so big. Oh, I love that. And that was Perez. Perez drew that, correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, so good. But uh, once again, Mr. Englehart, it's always an honor to have you. Can't wait to see you out uh, out on the battlefield and joining you uh, at a convention and stuff again. Uh, so, yeah, we'd like to thank everybody for joining us. So, Steve, any last words? Again, thank you so much, uh, Steve. It's always a pleasure for me. I'm always pinching myself and going, God's sakes, I'm speaking to Steve Engelhart here. You know. <laughs> so again, I really appreciate you spending some time with us. Uh, All right. I, I think Steve, get us out of here now. Boom. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us on Pop XP. If you haven't already, make sure to click that subscribe button and also click the bell for notifications when we go live and we upload some awesome new content. Also, don't forget to head on over to Twitter and follow us at the Pop XP and over on Instagram at the Pop XP. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you soon.